Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. How do we keep a balance between our ego and our heart? What are the ways to keep our ego in check? If the ego came and before it told us anything, it said, okay, just to let you know, now is going to be the voice of the ego. It's much easier to handle. Those of us who have been on, on a spiritual path for a while and are very introspective, we recognize the ego. And it makes it, it's still there, but it makes it, it makes it somewhat easier to deal with because you start being able to see, ah, oh, this is just my ego. So even though it's still present, it's not quite as dangerous because we're able to look at it. We've developed a habit of being able to say, ah, I know that voice. That's my ego. I know that mask. That's my ego. I know that game. That's my ego. So for me, for example, I know when it's my ego saying something. So it's not that it goes away entirely. It's not about being kept in check. It's not that I can feel my ego saying something and I lock it in a box and throw away the key. It's not the answer. Because then you just have it screaming from in a box inside you. But the last thing that you want are voices screaming from lock boxes inside your own psyche. The point of the spiritual path is freedom, expansion, openness. And so what I have found the best way to to deal with the ego is, first of all, we have to learn how to recognize it. Because when we can't recognize the ego, that's when it's dangerous. When the ego takes the form of that inner wisdom, or the ego takes the form of a really valid fear. No, you shouldn't try that. Because if you try that, you could fail. And if you fail, then you will, if you fail, then you will be horribly humiliated. And it sounds like it's a really valid argument. But on closer inspection, we realize it's just the voice of the ego telling us you're small, play small, don't ever have courage, don't step up to the plate, don't think outside the box, don't actually expand into the truth of who you are, just stay in this little box. But it's, it's insidious because it doesn't say, by the way, this is just your ego sent to scare you. This is just your ego sent to keep you small. It plays as this very rational, very good, very smart, very helpful voice that's going to guide you on the right path for your life. And really all it is, is a a mix, but it's it's not a blended mix. It's not like you've thrown all the voices in a blender. It's much more like a really out of sync orchestra of lots of different voices. Some of them are going to be voices of our culture that may say things, for example, like women shouldn't do that. 
girls shouldn't do that. Or that may say, you're too old to do that, or you're too young to do that, or you're too poor to do that, or you're not rich enough to do that, or you're not smart enough, or you're not good enough. Or it may be something that says you're, you're stupid, you're worthless. Maybe something that says don't take the risk. Not a smart decision. So these are voices of the culture that have really been given to us in many ways over our lives to keep us playing certain roles. Some of it may be voices of our, our parents or our teachers or other family members who meant well. That's the thing. The people are not meaning badly. They weren't trying to harm us. They're just doing the best that they could. Speaking from their own place of fear, from their own place of confusion, from their own egos, from their own subconscious programming. And so, maybe for example, when we were young, maybe we got the message in our, in our home that when we came home with good grades, when our room was clean, when we did all of our chores, we got the message from mom or dad that we were a good girl or a good boy. And so we grew learning that our goodness, our value as a human being was rooted in what we did. Cleaned up your room, good girl. Got good grades on an exam, good boy. Didn't do well in school, didn't clean up your room, didn't do your chores, came in too dirty. Bad boy, bad girl. Now again, this is just honest, well-intentioned, good-hearted parents trying to do the best they can to discipline their kids, to have us clean our rooms, to have us do well in school. But the, the messages that we take in are who you are as a person, your value as a human being is based on what you do. You do well, you do what I want, you are good. You get a place on my lap. You get a big hug and kiss. Maybe in some houses you get cookies and cake or special ice cream or whatever it may be. You don't do what I want. Well, suddenly I'm not so, so eager to bring you into my lap and give you hugs and kisses. Now I'm disappointed. I'm upset. So what we also learn is that my actions are those that bring happiness or sadness to people I love. That's, that's a heavy responsibility for kids. Not only is my value rooted in what I do, but mom and dad's happiness is also dependent on me. Look, mom was so happy when I came in from school until I told her I failed my math exam. Now suddenly mom's not so happy. Look at, look at the responsibility that I have to keep mom happy. And I mention this because this is all the stuff that our ego gets built out of. When most of us talk of ego, we think just of arrogance. But the ego is much, much deeper and much more subtle than just arrogance. The ego is not only the one who says, Oh, you're the best. Oh, you're the smartest. The ego is also the one that says, you're stupid, you're worthless, don't do that, don't take the risk. Who do you think you are? So on the one hand, the ego may be the one who says to us, who the hell do they think they are? Like, don't they know who I am, that they should be much more respectful to me? But the ego is also the one who says to me, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to be so brave? Who do you think you are to start that project, to be able to do this, to dream for that, to want to accomplish this, to stand for that? That's also the voice of the ego. And so this is where I say it's like an out-of-sync orchestra. It's a lot of different sounds. It's cultural sounds, societal sounds. Sounds of parents, sounds of teachers, sounds of so many people's voices 
that we've internalized growing up. And so when we talk about keeping the ego in check, it's not about pushing it away because you end up then locking up a lot of voices. The ego is not just one thing that you say, go, ego, in the box. As I said, it's all these different, different voices, different feelings, different fears, different desires. A lot of what we yearn for, a lot of the stuff that we call success, when you have a lot of money, when you have a good job in a good company, that's what we view as success. Well, again, this is, this is workings of the ego. This is cultural and societal norms that we've internalized. Oh, you got that job in that company? You must be really proud of yourself. Oh, you're an artist or a musician? I'm so sorry, is there nothing else you could do? Right, I mean, this is, this is sadly the way that our culture operates. Parents whose children are, are punch and time clocks in multinational companies, oh, you must be so proud of him or her. Parents whose children are artists or musicians, sannyasis, school teachers, get, oh, hmm, interesting, right? Not the same, oh, you must be so proud. So we live in this culture again that's giving us all these different norms. What's, what's acceptable? What's success? And then, of course, we judge ourselves by that. So when we talk about the ego, it's, it's a lot broader It's a lot more subtle. And so keeping it in check is not about, as I said, sticking it in a box. It's about being aware of it. That's all it is. Being aware. Oh, yeah. There's the voice of my fifth grade teacher who told me I would never amount to anything. Well, that's all right, because Einstein's teacher told him he wouldn't amount to anything either. So, okay. Can live with that. Ah, There's the voice of my mom or my dad or an uncle or an aunt or a a relative who told me that I was only valuable if I looked a certain way or acted a certain way. Told me I should gain weight or lose weight. Try some new fairness cream, dress differently. Well, okay, I can understand. He or she was going through their own their own difficult time. He or she had their own issues. And we start to really understand the pieces of our ego. We start to be able to see them for what they are. Oh yeah, I understand how this is a cultural norm. And just to be able to name it for what it is. And then when the ego comes up, you're able to look at it not as some horrible evil being, but just kind of as this annoying neighbor who sometimes gets a little bit too loud when you're trying to meditate or think or sleep, who you meet on the doorstep. Maybe you used to let the neighbor in the house because you didn't realize that you'd never get him out. But now you meet that neighbor on the doorstep. You say, oh, so nice to see you. No, now is not a very good time, but I hope you have a wonderful day. See it for what it is. As as you see the ego arise, and this is really what a lot of the, the path of mindfulness is about. It's not about bad ego. It's about just understanding, yeah, I have these, these components in me that have that have been imprinted upon me during different aspects of my life. They're not the truth of who I am. They're not soul or spirit or consciousness or love or truth. They're just impressions that have been made upon me by different voices, different values, different experiences I've had. Maybe I was made fun of in a class for being too fat or being too skin, skinny, so I developed a, a complex about it. Maybe I was made fun of in class for not being able to do math. So I became afraid of math or afraid of numbers. I convinced myself I'm not a, 
not a math person. Whatever it is, we start to see things and understand where they're from. And what happens then is they just lose their power over us. So the way to keep the ego in check is simply to see it for what it is. It's just impressions upon us from people, from places, from experiences that are are not truth, not capital T truth, not wholeness or fullness, not soul, spirit, consciousness, but that are just impressions. We see them for what they are, but we don't let them run the show. So like the neighbor, you've come back to tea today. Well, unfortunately, not going to be a good time. But nice to see you. So we're not killing it. It's not about kill the neighbor, kill the ego. But it's also not about feeling horribly, oh my God, that neighbor came to visit again today. Oh my God, my ego came back. Just see it. Yeah, there was my ego. And you actually can develop. And for me, I have found this works personally very well. Just a very, a very deep interest. My ego arises and I think that's so interesting. Hasn't come to me like that in a while. That's a whole new face of my ego that I haven't actually seen before or haven't seen in years. Wow. How interesting. I wonder what it was about that situation that made that aspect of my ego come up. And then it becomes just another pathway into understanding ourselves. And so see if you can develop instead of this love-hate, I've got to kill you relationship with it. Can you develop just a, a bit of interest in it? Hmm. But nothing that's too serious. Nothing that takes it too seriously. Again, it's just, it's your quirky neighbor. Kind of knocks on the door at all hours. Not very convenient times. See it. Acknowledge it. Recognize to yourself, oh, that's my ego. But don't invite it in. Don't sit it down for tea. Don't bring it into your bed. Don't give it a room in your house. Don't leave your house to it in your will. Don't give it any, any control over you. Just recognize, yeah, you also exist. And then we come back into our spiritual practice of creating space. Instead of trying to squeeze the ego out, can I, can I be aware of a spaciousness in me that also includes space for this guy over here to coexist? He doesn't get to run the show. He doesn't get to tell me what to do. He doesn't get a room in my house, at least not my inner house. But I'm not looking to kill him, annihilate him, You know, we talk about annihilating the ego. And I've always felt that that's a really, I mean, it's it's ideal if you could do it. But I've never seen it work in an effective way. Usually all that ends up happening is you're doing battle with yourself inside. And the problem with that, as I always say, is you go to sleep with the loser. It doesn't matter who wins. You're all in one bed together. It's all all inside you. And so if you've got to take the loser of the battle to bed, do you really want to try to have a battle with yourself? Instead of that, understand, yeah, the ego's there. It exists. I know what it's made out of. I know where it came from. I can see the different pieces. I don't need to annihilate it. But I just need to understand he's not running the show or she's not running the show. And the less power you give it over you, the less troubled you'll be by it. The ego is powerful only when we run from it, we're afraid of it, we're trying to annihilate it. 
we just can kind of see it and smile at it and say, have a good day. Thanks so much. I've got something more important going on. It actually ends up being much, much more innocuous, much more harmless. And then it just coexists in this ever expanding space of the truth of who you are. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi. This is Christina Ricci with RAIN. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. How to be at peace with your wife. Begin with the humorous and then come to the more serious. My my dad is an attorney. This is true, not a joke. My dad is an attorney. And he practices divorce law. So literally, and in LA, it's a full-time job. So from morning till night, all he has done for the last 45 years is get people divorced. He used to do it as a litigator. He now does it as a mediator. But he has spent literally his entire career only with couples who are getting divorced. And he happens to be a very smart man. And my dad has a a saying, a teaching, which I love and I share as frequently as I can. And the teaching is, you can either be right or you can be married. You can't be both. In India, where divorce is not so common or prevalent, we could amend it slightly to say you can either be right or you can be happily married. Because maybe you won't actually get a divorce, but then you just find yourself in a miserable relationship. So you can either be right or you can be happily married, but not both. Meaning, you have to decide in every situation Is it more important here to be right or is it more important to be at peace? And there's very few situations that arise in a marriage that are more important than being at peace. I mean, if your wife said, I'm going to, you know, take a gun and go out and kill all the neighbors, well, then by all means, stop her by anything you have to do. Even if it's a fight, fight her, stop her from killing the neighbors. But if what you're talking about is what you're going to have for dinner, if what you're talking about is the basic day-to-day stuff of life, is any of that really more important than being at peace? Of course not. You may end up getting the dinner you wanted, but you've got indigestion because you've been fighting. You may end up winning the battle but you sleep alone. So what what have you really accomplished? And so, you know, Puja Swamiji, it's been been actually beautiful because Puja Swamiji, of course, gives all of the teachings from, from the scriptures, from the Gita, from the Vedas, from the Upanishads. 
My dad has never read the Gita or the Vedas or the Upanishads. He gives teachings from his life. But it's been interesting because the teachings, particularly with regard to this, overlap completely. So at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, after Bhagavan Krishna has told everything to Arjuna, the end of it, he says to Arjuna, I've told you everything. Now you do whatever you think. Not I'm going to hold your hand to the fire, you must do what I say. But I've told you everything. Now you do whatever you think is right. What does Arjun say? I will do whatever you say. Karishyevachanamtava. I will do whatever you say. And Pooja Swamiji always says, this is the secret to a happy marriage. Realize, yeah, realize that ultimately the point of being married is not about getting your way in the little things. The point of being married is using that as a way to get closer to God. That's that's what life is for. So whether you're in the brahmacharya phase of life, whether you're you're in the grasthashram phase of life, vanprasthashram, sannyasashram, whether you're in any of those ashrams, at any point of life, the ultimate goal is to progress spiritually. And so it's never about getting my way. It's never about the external things. You would never say, oh, this guy is very, very successful as a grest just because he's got a good job and lots of kids. Success in the householder phase of life is when that family is one. where through their family relationships, the husband, the wife, the in-laws, depending on whoever is there in the extended family, they're all progressing closer and closer to their own spiritual awakening. The ultimate goal of a family life is not just that we should be able to agree on what we eat on Sunday mornings, that we should be able to agree on what TV show we watch, the ultimate goal is not even that we all should, you know, get along and play cards together after dinner. Ultimately, the whole point of that phase is through that phase to get closer to God. It's not that we spend our lives far from our spiritual path and only when we get to that sannyas phase do we become spiritual. All four of the phases, all four of the ashrams are for spiritual opening. So the question in the grasta ashram phase is how can I use this? Okay, cello, I'm here. I didn't choose to take sannyas in advance. I chose to go through this. How can I use this phase? to get closer spiritually. And recognizing in every moment that I have the choice to choose peace. Number one. Number two. Not only do I have the choice to choose peace, but recognizing that my emotional state is 100% up to me. Doesn't mean that my husband or wife or in-laws may not be the most annoying person on the face of the planet. I mean, somebody's has to be the most annoying person on the face of the planet. Somebody's will be the second most annoying person on the face of the planet. Somebody's will be the third most annoying person. Granted, you may absolutely have married the most annoying person on the face of the planet. It is possible. Somebody has to have married him or her. Most likely. Maybe it's you. Who knows? But even if it turns out it's you, nonetheless, 
your emotional state is not determined by that person. No one has the power to reach their hand into you and to take all of your neurons in your brain, to take the chemicals in your brain, to rearrange the electricity, the chemicals in the brain, to take the adrenal glands on your kidneys and squeeze them till they secrete adre adrenaline. It's your brain that does that. Nobody reaches in and grabs them and squeezes them until you've got adrenaline pumping through your body. We secrete adrenaline because our brain says, I'm stressed. Well, again, nobody's gone into your brain, pulled the right neurons, you know, like our blinds in the house, open something, shut something. Nobody can do that with your neurons and get them to get stressed and upset. We do that. We are the only ones who actually have the power to impact the workings of our own brain like that. Unless you happen to be married to a you know, neurologist who's removed your skull and is prodding you with a, a metal probe. But if not, if you've still got your skull all on, you're the only one in charge. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to realize you may be the most annoying person on the planet and I am still able to be in peace. Look at that. I'm still able to be happy in this moment even though I'm face to face with the most annoying person on the planet. Because that power is within me. We, we think that people outside make us unhappy, make us stressed, make us miserable. They do not. We choose. We choose what you did is something due to which I'm going to become upset. I have that choice, which means I also have the possibility to choose something different. And this is my favorite question in the world. Every time you find yourself getting upset, ask yourself the best question. Is there an alternative? And the reason that I love this question is it's not a criticism. It's not something that says you're a bad person. It doesn't say you're not spiritual. It doesn't say anything. It's simply an open-ended question. Is there an alternative? Do I have a choice? Might there be a different possible way of responding in this moment? And what you'll find is there's always an alternative. Even if you're married to the most annoying person on the planet, there is always an alternative. And you've got free will to choose whether to take that alternative or not. But if you don't, then you need to realize you've, you've chosen that. <coughs> and that's up to you. If there were an easy answer to the wife and mother situation, we wouldn't find an almost infinitely large pool or ocean, rather, of movies and sitcoms and books that come out of this dilemma, right? If it were a simple solution, you wouldn't have TV producers, movie producers come up with more and more and more storylines about it. That being said, when you find yourself in the middle, the first and most important piece to realize is that's not your job. Presumably, you've married an adult, right? I mean, presumably you don't have a child bride. Your wife is an adult. Your mother's an adult. That I know. If they're both adults, they should be able 
to have an adult relationship. If you can help, by all means, help. Because, of course, they're both going to come to you. But if you find that you have really done everything you can to help and nothing helps, then you need to be able to say to the two of them, and I would suggest saying it to them together, bring them together, put an arm around each of them, tell them both how much you love them both. Tell them how much it hurts you that they don't get along. Maybe do it on your birthday. Maybe do it on Diwali and say, for God's sakes, I know you're going to give me other presents. I don't want any other present. The only present I want, if you actually love me, is to please get along. But you have a very unique role also, which is you have insight into your wife's behavior and her way of thinking. You have insight into your mother's way of thinking and behavior. And in situations like this, there's almost never one person who's right and one person who's wrong. It's almost always the two of them push each other's buttons. And then you develop a pattern and it moves and it gets worse. If you can recognize this, and you can help them each understand. You know, you can say to your wife, Deiko, you've seen 500 times that mom has a fit when the salt is kept over here and not over here. She has a fit when you cook these two things together. Tika, it may be totally unreasonable. But kya bari baate to karo na. I mean, really, like, who wants to live with another fit over a stupid thing that we can easily solve? And help your wife understand that she has an opportunity to choose peace. It may not make any sense why the salt has to be here and not here. It may not make any sense that these two dishes cannot go together. But these are the little compromises that we make, that we say it's more important to me to have peace in the home than to put the salt shaker where I want it to go. I'd rather put the salt shaker where she wants it to go than have every meal end in a fight. And in the same way, help your mom. Hey, Ma, come on, really? She's young. She's new. She's trying. Up to my. Right? Really? Choti choti chizon kabadami? You're gonna lose yourself? Hare ma. Apto madabmahane. Right? You know, I mean, help your mom also understand that she's supposed to be a role model here. The role of the mother in law is not to engage in small nonsense things. She's now supposed to be in at least the Van Prast Ashram phase, if not the Sanyasa Ashram phase. Help her understand. He, there was a time when you got to decide where the salt shaker went. When I was young, we got in trouble if the salt was out of place. Up to Choro, ma. Right? And you can, you can do some of this. So I would say do as much of that as you can do without losing your mind. But also take them both and help them understand they are adults. And don't engage with each of them. So if either of them come to you complaining about the other, what you have to say is, They have to understand that they will not get any reward for that behavior. If I know, I'll give you an example. I love to tell stories. I'm a storyteller. Sometimes they're apocryphal stories, parables. Sometimes they're true stories. Sometimes they're true stories of my life. Sometimes they're other people's stories. I'm also someone who, as I go through my life, things that happen, I think, oh, that's a good story. And for Manhota, you want to share it with somebody. Oh, you won't believe the funny thing that happened to me today. 
Now, something very interesting. When I've observed extended periods of silence, if I've gone into silence for several days in a row, what I notice is my mind stops even noticing stories because I know that I won't be able to share it with someone. And it's not so important ki ek hafte ke baad, you're going to say, acha ek hafte pale, this little funny thing happened. People would say, really? You've spent a week in silence trying to remember this funny thing that happened last Tuesday? <laughs> like, or nothing else has happened in your life? It's a little thing. If you see somebody 10 minutes later, it's a story. But a week later, it's not a story. And so what I have found is, interestingly, if I know Okay, I'm in silence, so I'm not going to be telling anybody this. My mind does not even remember it. Like it just, it, it flows like a river. It's like a line in the sand. But if I know, oh, this is a great story. Oh, I know who's going to love hearing this story. Then I remember it. And I share this with you because if either of them knows, okay, oh, I'm going to tell him this, they will hold on to it. Until they see you, they're going to want to remember it and tell you. But if they know, he's not going to listen. They won't hold on to it because they know that there's nobody I'm going to go and tell. And make all the family members part of this. Anybody else who they tell stories to, make sure that everybody says, No story zone. No drama zone. Put up signs in the living room. No, no drama zone. Like we have smoke-free zones, drug-free zones, drama-free zone. Put a sign on the din- dinner table, drama-free zone. Because if I know that I can't share it, I'm not going to hold on to it. Maza tabi hai if I can share it with someone. There's no maza if I'm just telling myself it. So if I know I can't share it, if I know a okay, drama-free zone, they'll also let things go more and more. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. What is the difference between love and attachment to our partner? Love is expansive. Attachment contracts. When you, when you think about the loved one, if in your heart you feel an experience of expansion, it's love. 
if in your heart you feel an experience of contraction that also is in the mind, there's attachment. And it doesn't mean that they can't go together. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Now, frequently, if there is absolute, highest, deepest, truest love, we tend to be free of the attachments. Now, there's an attachment to the person themselves, as in, I really love having you in my life. Here, physically, before me. That's the attachment that when the person leaves us or passes away is so difficult to to manage because with the love, there is the attachment to the, the presence of the being whom we love. But in our loving relationships, we suffer from a lot of other types of attachments that actually eat away at the love. And those are attachments to how the other person behaves. So I love you as long as you're doing what I want. When you don't do what I want, then I hate you. So that's something we need to look at. Do I love you or do I just love having my ego fed? If I love you when you're really nice to me and you do what I want, you treat me the way that I want to be treated and you do everything I say, well, then maybe I should just hire some staff instead. Where's the love there? It's obedience I want. Not love. If I love you, then regardless of what you say or do, whether it's what I want or don't want, I'm still going to love you. Now, that doesn't mean I approve of everything you do. It doesn't mean I like everything you do. But it means that my love of you isn't dependent upon what you're doing. And this is especially important with our children because as far as our spouses go, most of us are mature enough to understand that if a spouse says to us, I hate you, most of us know that they don't really hate you, but that they're just angry at the moment, that that hatred is ego hatred. And that they're going to soften, whether it's five minutes later, whether it's an hour later, but that eventually we're going to soften back into love. The problem becomes much more with our children. Because what our children learn is that my, my value as a human being, my worthiness of love, is based on what I do. So if our children clean their room and we say, oh, that," and we didn't even ask them to do it, but they did it anyway. And we say, oh my God, come to mama. And we hug them and we kiss them and we put them on our laps and we say, oh, mama loves you so much. Your mama's good girl. Your mama's big boy. We give them all of that. And then when they don't do it, we yell, we scold, maybe we punish, we withdraw love. Now our minds say, but no, I don't. I still love them. You know you still love them. But the look on your face is no longer a look of love. The child comes home with an A on their report card. Oh, come to mama. Mama's so proud of you. The child comes home with an F on their report card. And suddenly it's go to your room. 
We yell, we scold, our face suddenly is drained of love. And what that child learns is my worthiness to be loved is based on what I do. I'm certainly still the same guy who brought home an A last week. I'm the same girl whose room was clean last week, which means that the love I got last week was not based on who I am, but it was based on what I did. And that's where it becomes really essential with our children, that they understand. doesn't mean that we love messy rooms, doesn't mean we love failing grades, but that we, we get creative in our parenting skills such that there's discipline, (coughs) there's rules, there's encouragement, there's punishment even, but that is not rooted in a giving and a withdrawal of love. That they understand mama's lap is still here, but no, you don't get to go to the party this weekend. Mama still loves you. But yeah, you're grounded all week. There's still discipline, but there's not a loss of love. And with regard to our our partners, our spouses, we need to really ask ourselves, is their action, are their words, is what it is that we wanted from them that they didn't do so important that it's worth not living in love in this moment? And there's not a right answer to that question. There may be things that for you feel important enough that it not not as important as being in love. I'd rather be angry. Okay. But ask yourself whether that works. So if you've been married, for example, 20, 30, 15 years, and you're angry every time he or she is late from work. But they're actually late three, four times a week. You can be pretty sure that getting angry isn't helping. That it's not actually changing anything. And so then you have to be realistic. Is What is the point here? I'm losing the experience of love in the moment. And I'm not actually even changing the other person's behavior. So maybe it's better just to be in love. And if the behavior matters that much to me, maybe I really should say to the person, all right, being, being angry hasn't worked. Is there another way I could convince you to show up on time? Is there another way I could convince you to speak to me, to treat me, to act, to be, to whatever it may be? Is there a way I could convince you to do this because it really hurts me? But in our attachment to how they act, how they speak, how they live, a lot of times that death grip literally squeezes love out of the relationship. And we find that we may get them to do everything we want, but we've squeezed the love dry. So we get really obedient partners, but we find ourselves simply cohabiting rather than actually living in love. And the question to ask ourselves is, is it worth it? Yeah, he now puts the dishes away every meal. But he's asleep by the time I get into bed every night. Was it worth it? Yeah. She now... There's all of this that I want. But spends her weekends out with all her friends instead of with me. Was it worth it? Was squeezing the love out for the behavior modification worth it? Did I get what I wanted? Did I really get what I wanted here? And the answer is usually no. 
So before you do that, ask yourselves, is what I'm attached to, is that behavior, is that action, is this thing, is that so important that it's worth squeezing the love out of the relationship? And then we let go of those attachments. So that we're able to actually exist in expansive love with our partners. Because eventually we will lose them. It's just the nature of the universe. If not through separation or divorce, through death, either we're going to die first or they're going to die first. So again, why not, why not live in as much peace and as much love as we possibly can? This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday same time on Ohm Times Radio. Mm-hmm.